welcome to the Beltway Broadcast, the premier podcast for the workplace learning and talent development professionals of the Association for Talent Development's Metro DC chapter. We've got some great resources in store for you today. Hello, fellow ATDers. I'm Stephanie Hepka, and I am the 2023 Vice President of Membership and Outreach, as well as a member of the Pod Squad here at the Metro DC chapter of ATD. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Eanes, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. And we also have Helena Hodges, our Vice President of Finance and Operations, as our producer. And for this episode, we are thrilled to be interviewing Jackie Ferguson. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we are really excited about today's conversation. We're going to be talking about inclusive language. But before we dive in, and I I always try to jump on this, I want to give everybody an opportunity to get to know you. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Well, my name is Jackie. I use she, her pronouns. I grew up in upstate New York. Went to college in Florida, settled in the middle in North Carolina. Um, so I, I'm kind of a Goldilocks type, right? Right in the middle. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, I am married. I have a daughter who is 21 in college that I'm totally obsessed with. <laughs> and um, I am the co-founder of an organization called the Diversity Movement which is uh, an organization that works with companies uh, that drive culture and transformational business outcomes through um, DEI. And that includes consulting, content, leadership development, some of the organizational tools that we have. uh, And um, I write a lot of the um, content or edit Um, I also work in products, so some of the products that we're developing to augment um, what we do and um, love it. It's it's great. I authored a book called The Inclusive Language Handbook, Mm -hmm. um, and I also host a podcast called Diversity Beyond the Checkbox, which I love doing and get to speak with a lot of amazing people and learn a lot of things, Mm -hmm. so... Wow, that is a fantastic background. I mean, you are certainly the right person to be here to talk about inclusive language, but uh, knowing that you're a fellow podcaster makes it all the more fun. So yes. <laughs> probably fun to be on that side of the table as opposed to the uh, the hosting side for a change. It so. is, absolutely. <laughs> So let's uh, let's dive in and learn a little bit about inclusive language. I think that's probably a phrase a lot of people are familiar with. But mm-hmm. as far as what a definition might look like or what that might happen to mean, that might be a little bit more elusive. Or perhaps it's that others have a different definition or you may have made one up over time. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about how you define inclusive language. Yes. Well, inclusive language is just the intentional word choice that you make to ensure that people around you feel welcome, feel seen, feel safe. And, um, you know, there are a lot of words that we use that maybe we shouldn't, maybe make some changes, but really it's about, am I going to make this intentional step? And this is something, you know, when you think about DEI broadly, it feels like this big thing, right? And mm. lots of activities. And with inclusive language, it's something that you as an individual can make a commitment to mm. and make subtle changes, small changes, a little bit of learning. And that can go a long way in creating environments of, um, of safety and, and inclusion for others. Oh, I love that. I the the intention there. Yeah. yeah. It, one of the things too, um, I'm really curious about is the awareness piece, mm-hmm. right? So I, I know there's so much involved in this, right? So it could be, um, you know, we're, we're not aware until someone shares with us. Like I became aware of maybe some words that I was using when I started using um, presenter coach in Microsoft PowerPoint. Mm-hmm. And it lets you know if you're using some language that's not inclusive. And I was like, right. oh, my gosh, I had no yeah. idea. So what are some ways that we can become more aware, but not be afraid to also speak with others? Does that, that make sense? Absolutely, Chris. And, and you know, that the most important thing is realize that this is a practice. It's not something that you're ever going to perfect because mm. language changes over time. Yeah. And so the most important thing is to become a student, right, of language. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to try and mess it up and apologize and, and learn from it. 
Um, I would say, you know, there are a lot of words that we have used growing up. We use in our um, environments, you know, as a, as a Northeasterner, I use the word guys to mean everyone <laughs> all the time. Yes. And getting out of that habit took me about a year of messing mm. it up over and over again. Yeah. And there are just so many words like that. But when you're making the effort, right? And and you make that mistake, you can say, you know what, I'm sorry, I mean everyone. And people are, what you'll find is that people are often afraid to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But generally, people are very open and, and encourage you to, to try and learn and practice. And they'll help you with language that makes them feel seen and makes them feel valued. Mm. You know, I'd love to to explore that a little bit more as well, because I think you're right that mistakes will hold people back. They're afraid of making them, but they're also afraid of what happens when they do. Yes. I recall a, a while back, I, I was in a conversation with somebody um, where there was a, a language misstep, if you will. Mm -hmm. Somebody said something, somebody else called them out for it. And yeah. After that meeting was over, I had another meeting with the person who had made that misstep and she was visibly upset about it, mm. just embarrassed and frustrated and very sorry that she had done that. Mm. And it got me thinking, I mean, a lot of times there will be an emotional response if you do make a mistake because none of us want to engage in that kind of maybe you'd call it exclusive behavior where you're not making inclusive decisions, you're not using inclusive language. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or strategies for how people can kind of come back from making a mistake like that if they are really impacted by it or they do feel really ashamed or sorry or, mm -hmm. you know, are having a, a difficult time. Absolutely, Stephanie. And, you know, it's such a good point that you made. You know, again, this is a practice. So you're yeah. not always going to get it right. You have to get comfortable with the fact that you don't know it all. Right. Mm -hmm. If you yes. if you were to read the inclusive language handbook, for example, there are lots and lots of words in there. Right. And <laughs> oh, you can't memorize them. Mm. It's it's a lot. Right. But really, it's expressing that you're practicing inclusive language, being open to um, some some criticism, but some some changes. Right. Like if if I were to say a specific word and someone prefers a different term. Yeah. Just to be open to that and and not take it as an indictment on you as an individual. You're learning, you're growing. A lot of this is new to a lot of people and that's okay. Right. You have to not only give other people grace, but give yourself some grace mm, that I, you're learning. Oh, that's so right. Great. And, and just say, you know what? I appreciate that. I'm really working on my inclusive language and I appreciate that feedback. Yep. I'm going to take that and move forward and don't hold it. Like yep. it's, it's Okay to make a mistake. I still make mistakes, right? And I wrote the book on it. <laughs> but you correct it, you learn from it, and you move forward. And, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. I love that. I do too. Yeah, along those lines, looking maybe at the macro level of the organization, mm -hmm. what are some things that the organization can do to support having an inclusive language culture? Absolutely. That's a great question. You know, it really starts at the top. If your leaders, you know, as a Gen Xer, you know, when I think about leaders, when I entered the workforce, they had all the answers. Mm -hmm. They never made mistakes, <laughs> right? They always got it right. But have it, but what, and right, is that's, I mean, and that's what my experience was. But now what employees appreciate are leaders that are learning, leaders that are growing, leaders that are willing to share leaders that are more transparent and vulnerable. And so sharing from a leadership perspective, you know what? I think inclusive language is a great way to make sure that our employee base feels included, feels safe, and we're creating the environment and the culture that we want at this organization. I'm using inclusive language. Um, you know, in my practice, please let me know if there are words that I'm saying that I where I should say something else. And if that starts from the leadership, it'll trickle down. So within our organization, all of us are in the practice of using inclusive language, but we all mess it up from time to time. <laughs> and 
it's okay, it's okay to correct yourself in the moment. That's a great way to let other people know that you're practicing inclusive language. And it's okay to correct others when you've got that environment of inclusive language to say, mm, do you mean this instead of this? And, you know, for our organization, we're like, I can't believe I said that, right? And it's it's more of just a learning and a path and a growth and, and continued progress. Yeah. I think you're starting to connect some dots for me as well. Um, some of what you just shared also kind of connects to uh, the question I asked you about making mistakes. And I think now what I'm thinking about is feedback. Yeah. Specifically, I'm thinking of a time where I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of online training. And a lot of times when I'm giving instructions, I will tell people to click on things, you know, click on this to bring up a menu or that sort of thing. And I did get some feedback from someone once who said, not all of us click. Some yeah. of us use assistive <laughs> technology and we don't all click. Hmm. That led to a very drastic change in my behavior where I started moving to the word select, which mm. seemed to resonate a bit better for others. But the way the feedback was given to me, it was a little jarring. It was very much a, hey, you're doing this wrong, do it differently. And I think that that sort of snapped something for me in my mind, but it did lead me to think about the idea of feedback. If you are somebody who experiences a situation where language is not inclusive for you, talk to us a little bit about what feedback strategies might be successful so that people understand where they might have made a mistake, but also maybe perhaps have that support so they don't lead to that sense of guilt where they've made a mistake and it feels unrecoverable. Absolutely. And this is something that I talk about a lot because people want to understand how to give feedback and yeah. give it in a way that it's received. If you're approaching it negative and strong and, mm. you know, disappointed, right. Mm. And, and all of those things, you're going to make a person feel um, defensive. Yes. And there's no learning in defensiveness. It's yeah. they go into protection mode. Yeah. But if I came to you, Stephanie, and said, Stephanie, you know, you use this word and I really prefer this word. This is the background of this word or this is how this comes across. Would you be open to using another term? Then we're having a dialogue and you're mm -hmm. open and you're willing to receive that. I think one of the, you know, it's it can be frustrating for people who are culturally diverse or people that are part of underrepresented groups to feel excluded. But yeah. the most important thing is to make sure that you're communicating in a way that other people receive it. Because mm -hmm. once, Stephanie, you receive that thing, you're going to tell someone else and teach someone else. And someone else is going to hear you saying those inclusive words and say, oh, maybe I should use these words instead. So yeah. when you have that conversation with one person, it has ripple effects to many more people. And if we keep that in mind um, and, and, you know, go from a position of education and learning and just, you know, let's partner on this and do it together. I think we come to better outcomes that way than I'm offended and you've offended me. It, it yeah. puts us against each other. And there's already too much of that in the world. I think we need to work together and get accomplished what we need to get accomplished, which is just being more human and being more kind. Well, I love oh. what you share there too, because what it does is it separates the person from the action. The person yeah. still has good intentions and a mistake does not define them in that case. But it also sounds like it really empowers them to not just change behavior, but then perhaps to model that behavior. And like you mm. said, they then become somebody that others can look to. They see what success might look like in this area. Yeah. And then, you know, that becomes something that people may, you know, aspire to be or recognize at the very least. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing to remember is that those un words that you hear that that can be offensive, right? It's so unintentional most mm -hmm. of the time. Right. Yeah. It's, right. it's just an education factor. It's not someone that's look seeking to um, be exclusionary or, um, be hurtful or be rude. It's someone that doesn't know, right? Mm -hmm. When when I grew up and everyone's, you know, I'm going to use my, my guy's example, or there are lots of things that I said as a child that now I'm like so cringy now that I know better, <laughs> right? 
but you yeah. just don't know. And and right. it, and and everyone is on their learning journeys at different mm-hmm. places. Yes. And you have to meet someone where they are and yeah. help them along and not discourage them from practicing. And yeah. you know, and and that attitude and that interaction makes a really big difference. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm hearing a big part of this too is assuming positive intent. Yeah. Absolutely. Across the board. Absolutely right. right. Yeah. Now I I um I mentioned earlier, so I discovered I am a hey guys user as well. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and I, I did not re- I did I always thought of it as gender neutral. And then um the Microsoft speaker coach yeah, I went through and practiced something and it said, hey, you're not using this inclusive language. Mm-hmm. And I also noted um, Microsoft Word, when you go into editor, it lets you know if you're using inclusive language or not. Awesome. So I thought those yes. were amazing tools. Uh, in addition to your book, of course, and your resources, are there Definitely. any other um, th- tools or just areas you think that people should tap into to become more aware? You know, I think the most important thing is to listen. Listen to how yeah. people refer to themselves. Listen to conversations about groups talking about their own group. And that's a great way to learn. Mm. And, you know, because, and that's one of the things we don't often do. So often we're listening to respond, right? And forming mm-hmm. that, um, that response to a question or to a challenge in our head and not listening to the details. Listen all the way through but, you know, from my perspective, just listening, how do people refer to themselves and really digging into that and then mm. and then incorporating that in your own language? We ask people to do two things that are probably pretty difficult in doing this, incredibly <laughs> important, but difficult. One is to pick intentional language. So be very mm. thoughtful about the words you use. And the other is to listen, yeah. which most of us just aren't good at <laughs> on a daily basis. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. I'm wondering, have you seen any successful examples, not necessarily to to name names or anything, but either examples or perhaps do you see the value in teams coming together to practice, to have a space Mm. where they can have conversations or give themselves, uh, you know, more of that opportunity to to try out language with others, get that feedback before, say, they go into a formal training like so many of us might do or uh, before they finalize an e-learning script or something similar? Absolutely. I think if you've got a culture of inclusive language, having people review your written um, words, so important. Mm -hmm. Going through some of your speech before you do it to catch those things, very important. Yeah. And then as, you know, one of the things about inclusive language is really just to think about the words that we say. One of the things that we do, because we're moving so fast from point to point to point and thing to thing, and we're thinking about four different things while we're doing this one thing, and really to slow down and say, hmm, what does this word mean? Where does it come from? Yeah. And, and asking that in your environments, you know, is this the most inclusive term? This seems maybe off. Do you have some recommendations for me? Yeah. And if you've got an environment where people are practicing inclusive language, then you can brainstorm. We do that all the time at the diversity movement. We can brainstorm ways um, to say that thing without using a word that can be exclusionary. And we do that all the time. The, the information that's in the book is is good information, but it's certainly not fully comprehensive of every single exclusive mm-hmm. term, right? Oh, and sure. so we're still learning, still um, asking the questions, and that's so important. Yeah. Oh, nice. Now, before we get to the rapid fire questions, is there anything else you want our listeners or viewers to know about inclusive language? You know, I would say just start practicing. Mm. Uh, You're never going to get it right. And we started with that. You're never going to get it right all the time. You are going to make mistakes. I still make mistakes. But really being intentional intentional about creating those environments where individuals feel safe in that Mm. environment with you, feel respected, feel valued. That's what that's what we want. And so. I encourage each person to just, you know, look at the language that they're using and think about it and make a couple of changes that can really change the environment around you. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Excellent advice. 
Okay, Jackie, at the end of every episode, <laughs> we get to the rapid fire questions portion. I'm excited. <laughs> where we ask three rapid fire questions, okay. less than 60 seconds response. Yes. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yes, I love it. Okay, what is one book everyone must read and why? I would say Six Thinking Hats by Edward de Bono. Mm, um, yes. The reason why is most of us think from one perspective or another. Mm. Um, Six Thinking Hats allows us to think all the way around a challenge, all the way around an idea. Um, and we have to practice that. Again, yeah. it's about practicing. And yeah. I think that's a great book and, and really helped me to think all the way around a challenge or all the way around an idea. I love it. Okay. What is one tool and you define that however you like, you can't mm -hmm. live without my iPhone notes app. Oh, I yeah. find that absolutely. In my day, I'm moving from thing to thing and I've got 10 different things going at once. So I have my best thinking sometimes in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, that's a smart question or that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then if I don't write it down right then, I'll forget it by morning. Yep. And <laughs> I use that notes app 3 a.m. all the time. <laughs> I love the right little timestamps too, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. What is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? So when I was about 11, my grandmother, Pauline, told me, no matter who you are, I can learn something from you and you can learn something from me. Hmm. And I think about that all the time. It creates hu some humility within me, right? No matter mm -hmm. what I do or accomplish, I can always learn from the person next to me. Those experiences and the life that they're living, I can always pull something from that, uh, mm -hmm. that individual. And it creates an openness for me to always stay open, always stay curious, um, and, and always know that you can learn from the person next to you. So that is definitely the best advice I've ever gotten. Nice. I think that is such well-stated yes. advice. And I have to say, Jackie, we have definitely learned something from you today. <laughs> oh, this you. has enjoyed. been just a fantastic conversation. This is such important stuff to talk about right now. I know, like you said, it's an area of growth for all of us. It will be a continuous area of growth for all of us. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you being here to encourage us not just to get started, but to know that this is a journey that we don't have to feel like it concludes at some point. There's always learning to yeah. do and practice to do. So we really appreciate you being here today. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you both. Oh, we're, yeah, this has been wonderful. And of course, a big thank you to all of you in our community for listening and for watching today. And before you go, we have a message from our producer, Helena Hodges. Are you interested in learning more about the Metro DC chapter of ATD or following us on social media? Go to dcatd.org and click on About. Would you like to be even more involved in our wonderful community? Go to dcatd.org and click on Volunteer to get started. Mm -hmm.